I'm Lisa Gibbons here with you in Irvine for Move for Minds. I have the star panel, superstar panel of all the eight cities today. You're going to love all of our experts. I want to jump right into it because we want to save plenty of time for each of you and for your questions. We'll jump out there with the microphones soon enough. I'll introduce them in short order, but I would like to begin with the gentleman to my left. This is Dr. Joshua Grill, who is from right here at UC Irvine, where he is, among many other credentials, a lead researcher there. You have the question of the day, which is, what is going on? Why does this disease disproportionately affect women? Okay. Well, thank you, Lisa. I want to um, thank the organizers for uh, letting me be a part of the event again. I was here last year, and it's nice to see that we're growing in our space and our attendance, so this is really exciting. Um, and I think uh, it's the question of the day. It's really more than that. It's, it's a pressing and critical question for us. Um, why is it that two-thirds of all Alzheimer's patients are women? Because that is a fact. Um, First and foremost, the driver of the difference in the, the number of people with Alzheimer's disease being women is that women are much better, much, much better than men at living to the ages when Alzheimer's risk increases the most. So for every five years we live after the age of 65, our risk of getting Alzheimer's disease doubles. And simply put, women are just better at getting to those ages. But even if we take that out of the equation and look at people who are older, women at increased age are at greater risk to get Alzheimer's disease than men at increased age. Now, maybe men who would have succumbed to the disease die at younger ages, and that leaves a, a disproportionate risk among women, but there are a number of other hypotheses for why this difference still exists controlling for age. Um, older people are at risk for AD, and 50 years ago, when people who now are at the ages of risk for Alzheimer's disease were in midlife, things weren't the way they are now. Women didn't have the same opportunities for higher education, for coming to a place like this and getting education, uh, <coughs> physical exercise, for having complex and challenging professional choices in their careers. And all of these things, in turn, have an impact on risk. Um, higher education, more complex jobs, getting physical exercise all reduce risk. And so, so women simply didn't have those opportunities when they were in midlife, and that may cause an increase in their risk as well. So over time, those are the things that protect your brain. So we... Yeah, protect and put at risk. Um, right. It's clear that there are two sides to the midlife risk story when it comes to Alzheimer's disease. There are things that we can all do, and I'm sure we'll talk about all day, to lower our risk, and there are things that increase our risk. So cardiovascular disease, hypertension, uh, high cholesterol all increase our risk while higher education, physical activity, good sleep habits all reduce our risk. And um, it does seem that both sides of that equation are really important to who does and does not get Alzheimer's disease. And some experts conclude that as much as 50% of the total risk for Alzheimer's disease is lifestyle based. So you're not your genes. Your genes do not have to determine your destiny. That's a good thing. It is, but lifestyle and genes certainly interact. And there are even suggestions that the strongest risk factor genetically for Alzheimer's disease, which is a gene called APOE, may have a greater risk contribution in women than it does in men. Come on! <laughs> and so we still have to figure these things out. And I think the moral of the story is that no matter what your genes are or what your sex or gender is, we all should do everything we can to lower our risk for someday developing late life cognitive problems. And that includes activities like the ones everyone is engaging in today. Let me circle back for just a second. Let's say I have APOE, you have it. It's going to hit me harder than you because I'm a woman? There are studies to suggest that is the case. Well, that just sucks. <laughs> I mean, seriously. I totally agree. Um, but, okay. you know, the good news is you're more likely to live to those ages than I am um, where it would matter. We love your spin, <laughs> but we're not buying it, right? <laughs> the good news is lifestyle. Okay, we hear that loud and clear. You're going to hear that from all of our panelists. And, and Malika, let's just go down the road here. 
This is Malika Chopra, yes, of the Chopra Chopras, as in Deepak. Uh, and so she grew up in a culture recognizing the value of meditation. And her latest book is about, it, it's called Intent, please tell me. Living with Intent. Living with Intent. But it's your messy journey, right? The subtitle is my somewhat messy journey to purpose, peace, and joy. So the messy <laughs> is the critical part there. And um, first, I want to thank you for having me and being with this panel. And I think my message today, um, and I've, I've spent a lot of time with Maria Shriver on these panels and doing, you know, speaking on these panels. And my message, you have great scientists here who can talk about the research. My message is find time, set intents for small changes in your life, whatever you, age you are, to start addressing this. So uh, Maria talks a lot about how the first signs of Alzheimer's actually can happen in middle age. And I found um, a few years ago, you know, I'm a mom, I have two kids, they're about 15 and 13 years old. I grew up in a family where I learned how to meditate, yoga, eat healthy. Um, I was the person who hadn't meditated for years because I didn't have time, didn't exercise, was stressed out, talking about meditation and balance, but even while I was in front of an audience thinking about my dry cleaning and my company and why did I have that chocolate chip cookie and double macchiato and you know just leading kind of this lifestyle that took over. Um, and so I made a recommitment to really look at what are the lifestyle habits um, that I needed to incorporate in my life to find more balance and happiness. So I am a big proponent of meditation. Um, when my father started speaking about the mind-body connection and things like meditation and yoga 30, 40 years ago, he was considered the East Asian witch doctor who sold snake oil. But now, every week, more research is coming out on the benefits of meditation, mindfulness, yoga practices. Um, from very practical, um, you know, distinguished things um, in terms of increasing learning and memory, um, decreasing cortisol and other stress hormones, um, you know, which build up and uh, have effects on our body, uh, to the decrease in telomeres and, you know, our aging process. So whatever age you are, um, you know, you can begin a practice that um, doesn't have to be regular. I think that's my main message. Um, it should be regular. We all should be exercising every day, meditating every day, and making our best efforts. But sometimes we need to forgive ourselves if we can't um, and then start again every day. Uh, so my message, and we can talk more about that, is you know, what are the different aspects of balance from sleep, good nutrition, movement, um, but also thinking about in our life personal connections. Um, do we enjoy what we do every day? Do we feel like we enjoy our work? Do we feel like we have a sense of purpose? Um, and I think all of those combine um, with practical steps uh, to help us lead a healthier life and also be better caregivers, um, because I know many people are also dealing with the stress and anxiety of caring for others. So these practices can help us as caregivers also have more balance. I can assure you that you um, are preaching to the choir up here on the panel for sure. Dr. Daniel Amen and Tana Amen uh, run the Amen Clinics, where they say that you need to be brain warriors. And many of the things that you're talking about um, that go on within your brain, Tana talks about nutritionally that you can heal yourself from the inside out. Dr. Amen has the world's largest database of brain, brain scans, including mine, my children, my husband's. Um, so he shows the evidence of how you can change your brain, change your life. So let's discuss further when you say brain warriors, Dr. Amen. You say we're in a, we're in a war with, with lifestyle choices, like Malika was saying. What's the war? So I often think uh, ISIS has nothing on our food industry. <laughs> that the real weapons of mass destruction are highly processed, pesticides sprayed, High glycemic, that just means it raises your blood sugar. Low fiber, food-like substances stored in plasticized containers. 
two-thirds of our population is overweight, 40 percent, according to a new study. Are obese. I published two studies that say as your weight goes up, the size and function of your brain goes down. It's the biggest brain drain in the history of the United States. We need to get serious about the war. And it's not just our food. We're bombarded with toxins. Uh, there's a cool app I think all of you should download. It's called Think dirty. Uh, it's free. You can scan all of your personal products. And as soon as you do, you'll throw out half your bathroom. Uh, because whatever goes on your body goes in your body. But you know, the, the biggest message of my life, since we've been doing imaging for the last 25 years, is that you're not stuck with the brain you have. You can make it better. We can prove it. Actually, scientists around the world now are proving, um, I think there's been 2,000 medication failures for Alzheimer's disease, according to the new Scientific American article. Get the Scientific American April edition. It's like one of the first successes against Alzheimer's. It wasn't medicine. And it's probably never going to be medicine. It's going to be lifestyle changes. Dr. Grill, would you agree with that, by the way? I absolutely agree that uh, changing lifestyle is really important to reducing risk for future cognitive problems and Alzheimer's disease specifically. And one recent paper um, from an incredible stroke prevention study, study that had a lot of midlife uh, risk factor information performed a new PET scan called an amyloid PET scan to see how midlife risk factors affected your likelihood of developing amyloid plaques in your brain later in life. And the strongest risk factor was obesity in midlife. Um, and in fact, having more than one cardiovascular risk factor in midlife was more impactful on risk than having an APOE genotype. Wow. And so these things are, are clearly important. Um, Christine Yaffe from UC San Francisco, who was given the, the Nobel Prize for Neurology, along with our own Claudia Kawas this year, um, has published papers that say reducing cardiovascular risk factors by 25% in this country would eliminate half a million cases of Alzheimer's disease like that. And so yeah, this doesn't surprise you, does it? Absolutely not. But I want to touch on something because this is an amazing panel and I applaud all of you for being here. It's a great day. You could be at the beach, but it's a choice. And I really believe that if you really want to do something, you will find a way. And if you don't, you will find an excuse, but you're here. And so that says a lot about all of you. And I, as somebody who grew up with a lot of trauma, drama, poverty, bad food, and bad lifestyle choices, illness on both sides of my family, I know that it's not always an easy choice, but it is a choice. And one thing I love about what you said, Malika, is um, you know, you're busy. We're really busy. And people often say to us, you know, how do you find time? Like, I don't have the time. And when you're busy people, you don't have time not to, at least if you want to continue being busy and productive and making a difference in the world. So I constantly flip that around in my head and say, I don't have time not to do this. So if my daughter is in a lesson, I will take five minutes, go sit in my car and ground myself and meditate. Or I'll go for a 15 minute walk and people might say, well, 15 minutes, what difference does that make? Well, I don't know. Is it better to sit down for 15 minutes and do nothing? So just, be easier on yourself about not doing it perfectly, but do something. And so those lifestyle changes, we don't want to deprive you of anything other than illness. Okay, this is not about deprivation, it's about abundance. And that's why the cookbooks and all the books that, that everybody writes to help you get this down. And it's about abundance of the right things. So there's a whole section on herbs and spices and how to do, why do they help? Because they, there are so many of them that help increase blood flow decrease inflammation. And that's all about what we're talking about. But you got to also do the other parts with focus and moving. And it's, it's really a combination and it doesn't have to be this perfect thing. You just have to start. Start somewhere. All movement matters. So I applaud you all for being here. Let me skip past Lori, if you don't mind, for a second to go to Katie Bauman because you're talking about movement. She is a scientist who's also into uh, biomechanics and movement is your thing. That's your life and your study and your work. And I find it so fascinating that you distinguish between exercise and movement. Tell us what the difference is. Oh, it's a, it's a 
it's a recent distinction, um, kind of as we were a sedentary culture by time, meaning even it used to be exercisers or sedentary populations and those who were non-sedentary got their hour workout in maybe three times a week, maybe even every single day, but on paper, mathematically, they're not that much different than people who don't exercise because you're still dealing with like 4%. Um, so there's been a recent distinction that kind of came up with the sitting as the new smoking research, right? I should just stand up. Um, which just feels better to move around a little bit. Preach. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's exercise, which is that bout of time that you're doing specifically to reap the health benefits of that bout of movement. Um, then there are, is physical activity, which is another category, which would be doing housework, doing housework less efficiently, getting on your hands and knees to scrub versus maybe using a mop and standing, where you're getting something else done besides just the physical benefits. And that's kind of been an unexplored area. We've told people, you need to exercise, you need to exercise. It's like, well, maybe we can talk about moving more, not necessarily take more exercise classes because you need a shower and you need a class and you need babysitter and you need to join a place to go, but maybe set up your kitchen so that you've got things high and low so you're building squats and more movement into your day. And then the age-old recommendations like don't drive around to park in the closest parking spot, especially when you're going to the gym, right? Um, and then there's movement, and movement is the larger, I always draw a Venn diagram with, you've got exercise, this is the smallest movement bubble, right? Because of in terms of time, as far as structured exercise, it makes up a, a very small percentage of the total movement we do in a day. And that lives within a physical activity bubble, but both of those live within a movement bubble. And the movement bubble is any physical displacement and your cells are what's being physically displaced when you move. But that goes for things like chewing. Chewing our food versus drinking smoothie, that's going to affect blood flow to the brain, for example. And we don't think of movement like chewing as something that would be part of this health or even brain health discussion because we've kind of hyper-focused on cardio and strength training and flexibility, those are our three main categories. But basically what I do is kind of expand those definitions and fill in lots of examples of how we can get more non-exercise movement, non-physical activity movement, and then of course, increase our physical activity as well. Tell this group about what you did with a, um, a, a group of elderly women, I think it was, um, in terms of getting them to be because Katie says that it, um, your flexibility is not limited by aging, it's limited by your, your habits, your habits. And you got incredible mobility from a group of at women in advanced age. Well, I'm a biomechanist, right, and I teach movement and work with large groups of people, but I think there's kind of a narrative that there's an inevitable decline as far as our movement capabilities go but that's not really a cross-cultural understanding. That is one particular group of people that live almost entirely sedentary lives. And so we are seeing what we consider how older people move is more how um, a sedentary population ages out versus how people who've been moving throughout a lifetime age. And so um, you're talking about the women that were in dynamic aging. They all started with me in their 60s, late 60s and 70s with all the same things that on paper many people have, the recommendations for pelvic floor slings and ACL repairs and, and whatnot. And 10 years later, this was tracking their 10-year progress, just a really slow, mindful first. Um, there's this idea of whole body sedentary, but because now we realize that movement is really creating um, epigenetic effects on the cellular level through a process of mechanotransduction, right, which is you move the cell, uh, the cytoskeleton, and then it changes the behavior of the cell. So that's why movement is an environmental factor. It's a lifestyle factor. So we started by identifying sedentary areas within their body, not assigning a whole body state as someone who is active or sedentary. And then once we could move those areas, then their whole body movement capabilities increased. And now they're 80 and 79 and 78, and they're hiking all the national parks barefoot and climbing trees, which is not really matching that narrative of what people are supposed to do as far as movement goes when they get older. 
another point for all of us that we yeah. get to rewrite the rules. You get to change your life if you change your brain and change your whole biomechanics. Which takes me to you, Lori. Lori LeBay uh, is a real passionate advocate. She created a thing called Alzheimer's Speaks and she has these um, care cafes and these real outlets for people who are diagnosed and their caregivers to have a voice because in case you guys haven't noticed, um, a lot of people with Alzheimer's disease are marginalized and don't have enough of a voice. What's your big message? My big message is shifting uh, caregiving from crisis to comfort. I think we all deserve that. Um, one of the things that I think we really have to um, take into account, though, is our verbiage that we use. So even though I use the word caregiver, I would really encourage people to switch to care partner or care companion. Caregiver sets up that crisis state. It says, I'm giving everything away. I'm not getting anything back. But being a care partner or a care companion says, we're in relationship. They're, they're, they're still here. You know, um, and that is so critical. My personal journey was with my mom, who had dementia for 30 years. And people go, oh, that's amazing. And I'm like, you're going to see a lot more of that with early diagnosis and more conversations and people becoming aware. And that is a good thing. My mom's um, journey was the biggest gift I'll ever receive in my life. And most people don't look at illness um, as that even being possible, but it, it made me a better person. It made me be more conscious. It made me um, slow down and let go of all the crap I can't control, but I've been told I can. And, and that's a gift so huge. It's, it's taught me to connect on different levels, um, to go within, to find peacefulness, and to, um, really push to raise everyone's voice. So some of the things that um, I have done when I created Alzheimer's Speaks was bottom line, I broke every business rule there was because I didn't want to work in a broken system. And so uh, I created Alzheimer's Speaks to raise everyone's voice. And I mean everyone's. That means the person with dementia. That means the family caring for them or, or a friend. That means business professionals, doctors, means authors, movie directors, everybody in this room has the power to improve our dementia care culture. Every single one of us. We can look at this as a crisis or we can look at it as a gift. And we, we have forgotten, I think, in society our, our power of one and the impact that we have um, on others. And so, um, through the radio show, through something called Dementia Chats, which is where I interview people a couple times a month um, and video it, and all this stuff is free on the website. Um, my experts have dementia. Who better to ask than somebody living with the disease? What do they want out of life? What are their perceptions of the disease? What, what do they want us to change? We need to have these conversations. They have wonderful insights great hope, and they'll tell us our flaws in a respectful fashion. Um, we, ha we really have to work together. It's such important work that, that she's doing, and you bring up uh, a world that Dr. Grill focuses on as well. You talk about in your research studies that people who are diagnosed with dementia, most of them are single, but in your clinical trials, most of those participants have a spouse. Does that directly correlate to what Lori was saying? I think it's all very much related. Uh, I personally believe that the only way we'll ever find a cure for Alzheimer's disease is through research. And clinical trials are the ways in which we test new medications. And they're inherently tied to our ability to find cures. And so I think of them as the, the last step in finding a cure. But they are extremely difficult to do. And one of the hardest things about doing them is to get enough people enrolled into a study to actually answer the scientific question. And as you say, in Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, two-thirds of participants enroll with a spouse. But in the world of who has Alzheimer's disease, most patients don't have a spouse. 800,000 people with Alzheimer's disease in the United States live alone, which we could talk about for a number of reasons. But um, in my world, that's something we have to figure out and get better at, getting those people into important clinical trials of 
promising therapies so that we can so that we can find new and better treatments because and, uh, yeah a lot of that has to do with those care partners and supporting those care partners better questions out here in the audience where are they what are they um, I don't want to monopolize the panelists although I'm very happy to if you don't have questions Tana um, yes while I'm getting back there, Tana, let me bottom line it for some of you guys as I'm heading back there. Coffee and wine, yes or no? Can we have it? Should we have it? Somebody give her a mic. Do you want me to? Yes, you go back there. Okay. Well, I'm going back to my talk show days, running around. So, so what we see in our clinics um, by looking at thousand, actually over 100,000 brain scans is that overall coffee and wine, if you drink too much of it, is not good for your brain. Alcohol is not a health food. Um, a little bit of coffee if you are not overdoing it, too much, too much caffeine will restrict and constrict the vessels to the, to the brain, so it decreases blood flow. A little bit of coffee, the problem is people are drinking these big ventis and they're having them all day long. That's what's bad. So what we do, and I actually have recipes for this in the cookbook, we will have half-calf coffee, we'll dilute it with some almond milk, do something like that. If you want a little bit of coffee, that's okay. A normal sized cup of coffee or two is fine. Um, as far as the alcohol goes, that's always a tricky one because this is where we get hate mail. Um, so I was you know, doing one Venom at her earlier saying what? But I've read these studies that said right. I could have it. She goes, well, with the wine industry paid for that study. Right. <laughs> Robert Mondavi paid for one of those big studies. So, so alcohol is not a health food. It's like a bell curve. There are some studies. There are, there are some benefits to drinking very small amounts of wine. Not so much for your brain. Um, and what does small amount mean? That's the problem is it's subjective, right? So if you have one or two glasses of wine, and actually it only showed wine, no other alcohol. So a little bit of wine, and I mean a little bit, is not so bad. But the problem is that bell curve, okay, people who drank, too, drank very much alcohol actually did very poorly. So that's where the problem is. People don't usually, they take small amounts to mean what they want it to mean. And that's what we've seen, is that that's what happens. So small amounts, if you have a couple glasses a week, probably not gonna do so much damage, but women who drank every day in one large scale study showed that they were at risk for 11 different types of cancer. So you don't wanna do anything that's gonna increase your risk of cancer. Um, and that's really one of the big problems. But no, it's not good for your brain, it's not a health food. So. Um, I have a question. I don't sleep well, and it's something I've struggled with forever and um, I've taken sleeping pills which really don't help um, and I read everything bad. Are there any real proven methods? Because it has to be something with my brain. I have to train my brain to sleep. I realize that. Um, but are there any really proven like hardcore brain training for sleep? Um, th th there are. and cognitive behavior therapy, which is learning how to manage your mind, is one of the things that can be helpful. Melatonin has between A and B level scientific evidence to help with sleep. I, th I think, you know, as I think about it with my patients, and sleep, sleep apnea, chronic insomnia, are a risk factor uh, for memory problems. And so I always think with my patients, what are the things you're doing that hurt your sleep, whether it's caffeine, exercising late, uh, a light room, a noisy room, a hot room, um, negative thinking patterns that are keeping you up. So what are the things to avoid and then what are the things to engage in? So my friends from the Kirtan Kriya meditation are here. I actually published three studies showing that Kirtan Kriya, a specific form of meditation, boosts blood flow, boosts memory, but it also helped to sort of calm down the busy mind, which is one of the reasons why people don't sleep. A little cocktail I really like, so I, I like melatonin for people who have trouble getting to sleep, I like 5-HTP, if you're a worrier and you're thought, you have a little mouse in your head and the mouse is on the exercise wheel and the mouse can't get off, 5-HTP helps. And I add, generally, magnesium to them. I think that cocktail works really well for my wife. 
Um, and you have to be very careful with alcohol. I mean, we could talk about alcohol all day long because there are you know, some studies that show it helps, some studies. And I'm like, look, anything that increases your risk of cancer, and that's not new. That's been around for a long time. I'm not a fan of it. Um, alcohol, a lot of people use it to sleep. The problem is, yes, it'll put your, it'll quiet down your neurons, and then three hours later they'll rebound, and so you end up waking up in in the middle of the night. So ask yourself, am I doing anything that hurts it? What are the things I can do to help it? In chapter four in our book, The Brain Warrior's Way, the training chapter, there's a whole section on, you know, here are 20 things typically that hurt people's sleep. Here are 20 things I can do to help it. And I would just advocate again the benefits of meditation. One of the things that I always hear from people um, is that you know they just can't sit and meditate, um, and you know it just seems too demanding. But I do believe that if you find five, ten, fifteen minutes, start with five minutes once a day to just kind of give your mind a rest. Remember that the benefits of meditation are not in the 5, 10, 15 minutes that you're sitting. The benefits are going to be realized um, in trying to sleep better or in trying to find more balance as well. If I could just add to that, because I'm, I'm a person who has trouble sleeping because of medication that I have to take for the rest of my life. It's not something that's going to go away. So I do everything that we talked about. So I have a thyroid... Um, I had thyroid thyroid cancer several times, and so I take high doses of thyroid and then a couple of other things, right? So, um, so I have to, so I, the magnesium and the melatonin really help. I'm not one of these people that's like, can do one or two things and my life goes really easy. I'm one of these people that has to do it all. Um, so the meditation works really well. When I first started trying to meditate, I just could not. It was just monkey mind everywhere. So what worked for me, especially for sleep, really helpful, was doing some guided imagery. And then I sort of learned how to take it from there. But dark room, you know, eye mask, earplugs, magnesium, <laughs> melatonin, meditation, I have to do it all. So, and if I don't exercise, then it, it makes it worse. It's just some people, you know, why, why are some things easier for some people and not for others? I don't know, but sometimes you gotta do it all. I would only add that, um, you know, we, our society has changed so much, right? So sleep really went down when the light bulb was invented. And I bet if we plotted the history of sleep, it's going down again now because of devices. And so I think, you know, sleep medicine docs talk about good sleep hygiene and making sure that the only things you're doing in bed are sleeping and maybe one other exception. Um, you know, put the iPad away, put the iPhone away, don't even bring it to the nightstand because um, when you turn it on and you're in bed, you're training yourself to be awake in bed. And so I think, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, all the things you talked about that have been talked about were fantastic, but make sure that you're, you're giving yourself the chance to sleep and not training yourself to be awake when you're supposed to be sleeping. I think that that's ever harder in modern society. Can I add one thing in on that? Because um, I think this works for both uh, trying to get asleep and then just living life. Um, I have found that basically we remember three things in life. What causes us fear, what causes us tears, and what, causes, uh, what brings us joy. And the, the fears are usually projecting into the future, and with Alzheimer's that can be a really scary, scary thing. What causes us tears is what we think we've lost instead of being grateful for what we had. And the joy is in this moment. This is the only moment you can identify it. It's the only moment you can create it. And so we have to decide what lane do we want to live our lives in. And not that we're not going to go to the fear and the tear at times, but how much time are you going to spend there? And I think if you go to sleep with joy, it's just going to be much easier because when our mind is spinning with fear and tears, I don't know about you, but I don't sleep. That's a real great gift of the disease, isn't it? Keeping you learning to be present. Your question? I thank you all for giving us your brilliant uh, answers here, but I had read that um, thyroxin or the thyroid problems have a lot to do with sleep, and a lot of women are hypothyroid, especially as we age. Could you talk a little bit more about whether we need more thyroxin while we're trying to get to sleep? 
Well, I think there's so many different thyroid disorders. So you can be hypothyroid, hyperthyroid, thyroid cancer. I mean, it really depends on what the issue is. We are seeing an increase in thyroid disease. Um, it seems that more and more women are hypothyroid. Um, if you've had your thyroid removed and you're being treated and you're on the right dose of thyroid, you know, you're usually feeling fairly balanced. If you're someone who, like me, who's had thyroid cancer that for whatever reason metastasized and continues to linger and they want to keep you on high dose thyroid to suppress the cancer, there's a problem. So if your thyroid's high, you're going to feel this wired, tired feeling all the time. If your, thyroid, if your thyroid's low, you're going to feel very tired. So I often have people write and they'll say, um, you know, I don't want to take thyroid medication. How can I treat it naturally? And I'm like, please go to your doctor, <laughs> okay? Because that's one thing I don't think women, I don't think anybody should really be um, messing with. And I think that there are things you can do naturally. I think you can do certain things with your diet to help optimize your thyroid. But if it's not correcting, I really do believe you should get it optimized, not normalized, optimized. So we are seeing this increase and they, a lot of it is, um, we believe, environmental toxins. So that is a problem. So I think everyone should go get it checked. You should educate yourself. We actually have a big section in our book on thyroid and environmental toxins and what you can do. But if it's not, you should be definitely going and getting it treated to get it optimized. But some of us can't optimize it, and so you have to do the other things. So that, that's actually a really important point. We often talk about know your important numbers, that they're just some health numbers you should know, at least on a yearly basis, like your blood pressure and your BMI. But we also think it's your thyroid and your vitamin D level, your level of testosterone, uh, even for women, because when they're not right, and Peter Drucker said this about business, you can't change what you don't measure. And so measuring your important numbers on a regular basis puts you in charge of your health rather than, you know, you go to the doctor whenever you are sick, and then really nobody's in charge of your health. So there are certain foods that are called goitrogens. If you are prone to having, say, hypothyroidism or thyroid problems, you might want to learn what those foods are. But you really should be working with an expert on thyroid for that. And that's where I, I really... I really encourage you to see a medical doctor for that because it's so important for your brain, for your energy, for your sleep. And when we're talking about brain function, thyroid plays a huge role. So, you know, sometimes medication gets a really bad rap and we're not, you know, we're not, medication's not good or bad, it's a thing. It needs to be used properly. I recently read about uh, coconut oil and there was a study that was done around the world where people were trying to find out where, which population has the least Alzheimer. And if I, if I remember well, it was in the Philippines, and that's because they eat a lot of coconut and coconut oil. And the result about, oh, on that uh, article were about um, taking, if you take two tablespoons a day for coconut oil, it helps after 20 days or 30 days, there's a big difference. So what do you think about that, coconut oil? I want to hear everybody on this one. Um, can you start? Sure. <laughs> so every place around the world where people live to be older ages is dealing with Alzheimer's disease as a problem. And every study that suggested the rates may be different in particular geographic regions has ultimately been debunked. This is not a disease that knows ethnic, geographic, racial boundaries. Um, there are some differences in risk based on race and ethnicity, but there's a problem everywhere. Um, as far as coconut oil, um, there, there is a, a book that was written to suggest that coconut oil may be an effective therapy for people with Alzheimer's disease. The hypothesis that one could come to around why that would be is that it's a medium chain triglyceride and it may produce something called ketone bodies that the brain can use as energy. Um, a friend of mine at the University of South Florida is actually now trying to do a clinical trial to test the hypothesis. To my knowledge, it's never been adequately tested in people with the disease or in an evidence-based medicine trial to see if it can reduce risk. Um, the hypothesis is interesting. Ketone bodies absolutely can 
uh, be used by the brain as a source of energy. There's also a medical food um, called Axona that's been granted marketing permission as a medical food, not a drug, in the United States with the essentially the same hypothesis. Um, they're doing clinical trials now. There are some small trials of that to suggest there may be a minor symptomatic benefit. So um, hopefully it works, but in my opinion, the evidence is not quite there yet. Um, but it also has very low risk, which is a good thing. What do you guys think? I was going to, what I've read is very similar to this. It's, I've never read the, the research that shows it, but I know about Axona. And, um, and it's because of the medium chain triglycerides. So, and coconut oil is cheaper, so. <laughs> It. Yeah, we're just passing it. My, my quick oh, reaction. Needing microphones. Um, because my quick reaction yeah. on that is, you know, it has to be holistic, whatever you do. So, you know, just kind of changing coconut oil, you know, may or may not have benefits, but I think at the end of the day, it is about exercise, giving your mind and body rest, eating well, dealing with the toxins in your relationships, the physical toxins that we're putting in and on our bodies. So, um, you know, my general approach has always been have a holistic, balanced approach, no matter what it is, because a new study will come out every other day, I think. <laughs> So if someone is taking MCTs, whether it's, it's coconut oil or whatever, if, if it has, if you're saying that's what it is, if somebody is ingesting that, that's okay? Maybe you can answer to this, Dr. Grill. So um, my understanding is it's the, the ketone bodies are what are helpful, um, but my understanding is Yes, it can be helpful, at least as far as we know or the hypothesis is, but you need to be pretty much doing a low glycemic diet as well, isn't that correct? I mean, it's not very helpful if, you're, like, yeah. if you've got so, high blood sugar. So I'm not a physician, so I uh, take everything on this with a grain of salt, I guess. But, um, you know, the other, the other opportunity to increase ketone bodies is by altering the diet substantially. And that may right. have negative health implications as well because it, it really is, you know, ketosis is, is not something that our body was designed to stay in for very long periods of time. And, and I'm sure there are studies around what it does to the liver and kidneys that I'm, I'm not acutely aware of, of the results of those studies. So I would, I would defer to the physician, but um, you know, the, the, the story that's told, and again, I, I don't think, I don't know that there is or is not evidence to support this, but the story is, that's told is that coconut oil and this medical food Axona can produce medium chain triglycerides without changing the diet, mm -hmm. which is one of the benefits. And so that the brain would have access to these things without potentially the negative uh, implications or the need to drastically alter one's diet. But I think this is all um, very early days in just how much we know as it relates to Alzheimer's disease. Well, and it's based on one case. So well, it's a physician's, uh, Mary Newport's husband, who she gave a lot of coconut oil to and seemed, but, but whenever you hear that, you should be skeptical. Um, because we need to do more science and bigger trials to go, well, will that apply to, to other people? Um, coconut oil is a good oil in the sense that you can cook with it at high temperatures. We use it at home all, all the time. But you want to be doing all the things, as um, people have been saying up here. You, you want to do all the things to decrease your risk. I have a new book coming in November called Memory Rescue. And the whole idea behind it is really simple. If you want to keep your memory or even rescue it if it's in trouble, you have to attack all of the risk factors we know. And I highlight 11 big risk factors in the book. Just taking coconut oil um, without changing your diet, without new learning, without socialization, is probably not going to do it for a general population of people. Your question. 
Um, my question is actually related to the whole ketosis issue. I'd love to know what your opinion is on intermittent fasting. I'm a physician. I help people eat better by teaching them how to cook with brain healthy foods. I've heard every diet fad over the years from my patients or whatnot. Um, I think the ketogenic diet is really popular now. Um, I know Dr. Bresden has some great studies out there, but where do you think the science is in terms of recommending intermittent fasting for brain health? We're fans. Yeah, so I'm a huge fan because if, if you believe, and this is you know, a fascinating question for Dr. Grill, if you believe that beta amyloid plaques are the cause of Alzheimer's disease, and that's actually sort of a big food fight in the scientific literature now, because the meds that are cleaning up beta amyloid are not working in large-scale studies. But the longer you can go between meals, there's a process called autophagy, which is your body begins to clean up those plaques. And so there are people recommending going 12 hours, which is actually not hard. If you eat dinner at 7 o'clock at night, don't eat breakfast till 7 in the morning. Well, that's not hard. Um, other people go, well, you really should go 16 hours. And people are finding significant benefit. Um, Josh mentioned uh, the ketogenic diet, and then you brought it up. I'm a huge fan because I, it decreases seizure frequency in children with seizure disorders by 50%. And there are 70 studies on it. And I have a granddaughter, we have a granddaughter, who was born with a genetic microdeletion syndrome. And at five months, it showed itself wicked seizures. And one day, she had 160 of them. And the neurologist wanted to put her on a cocktail of medication that would basically wipe out her immune system. And I'm like raising my hand. It's like, well, let's do the ketogenic diet. And I ended up having to fire him because he didn't know about it. And at the University of Oregon, they have a ketogenic clinic. And basically, for the last five years, she's not had any seizures. They didn't think right? she was going to live until she was three. There was a good chance that she wouldn't walk without a walker until she was five. We have a picture of her walking herself into preschool at three. And, and there, there are a lot of people that have done the ketogenic diet for a long time. Now, generally, I'm not a huge fan because you miss out on most of the plant medicines. And you know, the reason to eat vegetables is there are medicines in them. But for um, certain kinds of brain cancer, they're finding it helpful. Clearly, for seizure disorders, they're finding it helpful. Um, I, I think it's something we should be paying attention to. So in general, we, we tend to like a modified version of it with a lot of plants. <laughs> so a lot of herbs, plants, spices, things like that. Um, not strictly ketogenic, except for like w what he was saying. There are cases. So We're back here. Your question. Okay. Well, we talk about physical exercise. I wanted to know how true is doing mind exercise, such as playing chess, doing puzzles, does that really prevent uh, Alzheimer's, or does it really help with your returning your memory? Is that true, or is that a myth? And if that's true, what, what's the most recommended exercise for our mind? Well, the strongest evidence to support it is, is mostly large cohort studies or epidemiologic studies. There aren't a lot of randomized trials. There's, there was one that was reported last year at a national, international conference to say that um, specific, one specific type of training might be better than memory training um, for reducing risk for dementia. But it's, it's really the, the epidemiolo epidemiologic literature. In my personal opinion, uh, the physical exercise has a lot more power behind it as a risk-reducing strategy than the cognitive. We recommend both. And, and again, I think I'm echoing everything you've heard so far. We, we recommend doing as many things as possible to lower risk. But in my mind, the pathways by which physical exercise can lower your risk for Alzheimer's disease are much more diverse. We know that physical exercise increases the number of newborn brain cells even as we get older. It can bring the, the rates of newborn brain cells back to the young level. It increases the, the production of blood vessels and increases blood flow to the brain. Uh, and it, it even in the brain causes the production of proteins 
that are important for brain, sur brain cell survival and function. So I often refer to it as a pleiotropic intervention. It, it does a lot of different things. There are a lot of different arrows coming off of physical exercise on the graph of how it might reduce risk for Alzheimer's disease. So I always say do both, but I always also say that I think if you're going to do one thing, physical exercise may be the most, uh, most powerful, although sleep is sort of catching up. Um, so when I you say, oh. go ahead, Lori. I, one thing I wanted to add is um, I, I think we don't talk enough about our social interactions. And, you know, we're into the games, we're into the pills and, and the exercise, but those social interactions, I think, are so vital. The memory cafes, the, the, the just having the conversations, um, keeping your connections. And we don't really talk a lot about emotional toxins or stress and the effect that that has on our bodies and, and how we interact with one another. And um, I think that the meditations, the exercise, everything everyone's talking about, I, I think is really powerful, but we have to remember who we are um, as a community and, and be in relationship because isolation is such a huge factor with this disease. And you know, um, being connected is another way of keeping our minds active. It's actually a new study out of Baltimore that showed people who volunteer um, had significant improvements in their memory scores. So isolation is a risk factor uh, for Alzheimer's disease. So being connected at church, in your community, however you can get connected to other people um, in a positive way. That was a really beautiful study, wasn't it? The volunteer it study. It was. Yeah. It was really very... Purpose is important. Purpose is important. I want to hit two things, um, and while I'm looking for more questions back here, um, Katie, when we're talking about movement that we could put into our daily lives, um, yes, the parking further away and all the rest, but are you talking about range of motion kinds of things that we should be doing that can, that can have us, get us into what you call dynamic aging? And then I want to get Malika to get us into some tips, some um, instructive meditative tips that we can take home too. Are there things that we can take away with us today? in your field that I'm leaving on the table here? Well, I'm just, I'm thinking about what everyone just said and, you know, the trouble with exercise and continuing to think of like, I have to do my exercise and do my reps. And, you know, it's very, for the scientific process, we have to parse things apart and examine them in isolation as much as possible. But that's not the way the world actually works. So sometimes as we're parsing things out and looking at them, we forget to assemble them. So I'm thinking about what you were saying about, we need more movement of, of certainly of, of all of the parts of our body, um, but also of the interworkings of our community. I'm thinking uh, in my mind, I'm thinking about this issue with being isolated. And again, exercise itself tends to be very isolating, right? You have to leave your life to go do it. And I'm thinking about groups of people getting together, moving through green spaces or blue spaces, which also, also have different benefits, the benefits of physical exercise. The definition keeps relating back to caloric expenditure. The whole entire investigation of physical activity revolves around how many calories you burn. So that's important to know that as we recognize that movement has non-caloric benefits that our questioning systems are a bit outdated. So we keep talking about everyone needs physical exercise, but there's recent things about it's heel strike in the ground that's actually getting the blood all the way up to the brain. So if you take sitting exercise, it's not going to be the same as non-sitting exercise, certainly all beneficial, but it's not the same, that there's, there's more technicality to it. So I was thinking about how, how can we move more of us be doing things that are, are new, whether they're learning chess or whatnot, just novel, the fact that you have to be more mindfully engaged in your environment when you're not taking your walk on the treadmill, but you're getting together with friends to invoke that community aspect. Um, it's not only the light bulb that is recent. Everything that we do is un unprecedentedly odd right now. Like we're, it's a complete outlier of, you know, as far as human experience goes, our social interactions are low as far as, you know, um, the nuclear family versus particular tribes, and we have night lighting, and we have heavily processed foods. Like, we're kind of off kilter, and we're hugely sedentary. We're doing everything 
entirely different than what has been done throughout human history, really, in the last, well, I mean, it keeps changing. In the last 20,000 years, the last 250 years, now we have the technological screen, like night lighting, blue screen, light, all those things in the last 10 years, right? These are all milestones or markers in transitions. So taking in that type of movement that moves you differently than your workout, I don't want to tell people that they need to open their shoulders or open their hips as much as get with a group of people to create a movement-based living experiences, not just get your physical activity, but explore your landscape with others, take your coffee date on a walking group of, or not coffee, tea, <laughs> water, right, whatever, that you're, that, you're, that you're exploring your life more with your body for better sleep, that it's all holistic in that sense of all these pieces really do assemble into a life. Yeah. yeah. You had a question, please. Hi. Um, last year I had a couple of, I mean, five surgeries with uh, uh, general anesthesia. And I also lost my mom with dementia. And I have severe uh, fibromyalgia and I have severe sleep apnea. And I've noticed that so from last year, my memory is just gone. And I've always been great, you know, whatever, you know, in college, whatever. And I had like a photographic memory. And right now I'm very worried about if the dementia that my mom, you know, who was very intelligent, whatever, you know, she became like that. And it's very scary for me. And I don't know if any of these, um, has been the cause of a, not a permanent loss of memory or it is are the sign of uh, dementia or al Alzheimer or what, I, what can I do? I, I can't sleep, of course, and the rest of the things. So you're, so you're listing a number of the and I'm very risk factors. Uh, yeah, my, my and, life and is And one of the stressful. most people don't know about is general anesthesia. And the, the studies are mixed. But what that means is there's half, half of the studies say it can cause significant problems. And it's like, I'm a psychiatrist. Why do I know about that? I, I look at people's brains. And I've had a number of people where I have their before scan, before general anesthesia and after. And I'm sure not for everybody, but for vulnerable people, it can significantly reduce blood flow to your brain. So if you've had general anesthesia, you have dementia in your family, you have sleep apnea, and you had fibromyalgia, it's, it's not a death sentence. It's a wake-up call for you to do all the right things, knowing that you're becoming more vulnerable to a problem. And for, for cases like that, I mean, in my mind, I would look at your brain and go, well, how is it? And the most exciting thing for me about looking at people's brains is, well, can we get it back? And in a high percentage, we actually have a program where we can look at your prognosis. They can get it back if they do the right thing. I just had, uh, on Friday, Shailene Johnson, who's uh, a well-known fitness expert, uh, and best-selling author. She came to our clinic two years ago because her memory was not good. She couldn't focus. Noise was really bothering her. She's becoming more irritable. And she had Alzheimer's in her family. And when I looked at her scan, it was awful. But um, I, I never tell someone, oh, your scan is awful. I'm sorry. Go, like, get your will in order. No, that's not how we work. And I said, but here are the things to do. And she did all of them, including a treatment I really like called hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I just scanned her on Friday. It was the two years, almost to the day. And her brain was remarkably better, as was her tested memory and her subjective symptoms. There's so much hope that, you know, you have these risk factors. You want to go, okay, what are all the things I can do that all of us have been talking about that can make a significant difference in your life. A couple of people had these. Are we, are we okay, Erin? She's going to call quits on us in a second. Yes. 
Uh, thank you. I know all of us here probably have someone who has been affected with Alzheimer's, and so we're concerned for, for them. What can we do today to get a baseline? I know that just recently in the register here there was some new test, but what, what can we do to make sure that some of these tests or things so that we know where we are at some point and then we can evaluate if we're getting worse? Thank you. You mean your brain get a baseline for you and your brain? Is that what you mean? A brain or the or any amnoid, brain you're about. Uh, you know, anything that you're worried about yeah. that could cause that. My dad passed away. He was, you know, when he stopped doing physical exercise, um, I think, you know, we didn't notice it at the time, but that was an indicator. And so obviously now we know a lot more, but is there things that we can do in any of the areas that would give us that baseline to test two years from now or three years from now? Thank you. I think if you're really worried about your memory, then you want to make sure that you're seeing a clinician who understands the aging brain, the diseased brain, et cetera. And that's generally going to be someone like a neurologist, a psychiatrist, a geriatric psychiatrist, a geriatrician. There are some primary care physicians who are wonderful at thinking about these issues, but not all necessarily. Um, after that, you know, I, I, I'm sure every panel member will have their own ideas. Mine is. If you're worried about your brain and you want to do something, one thing you can do is participate in research. And unless more people participate in research, we're not going to find a cure for this disease. And there are a number of studies. You're fortunate to live in a place with a lot going on, a lot of expert clinicians who are available. Um, you know, our institute is a National Institutes of Health funded Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We have a lot of clinical trials. We have longitudinal studies. There are a, a multitude of different types of studies that are happening here and other places that all need more people to participate. And I, I just can't say it enough or loud enough that if more people don't participate in studies, at best, we're going to be delayed in finding a cure. And if more people participate sooner, we're going to expedite the process. And where do you find those studies online? Well, so, I mean, I'll, I'll, again, I'm sure every panel member will have their own ideas. Um, we've created a new tool called uh, Registry, where people can log in, sign up, tell us about themselves, so that um, we can use it as a dating service. Um, we can find the right study for the right person. And that is called the Consent to Contact, or C2C. And that's at c2c.uci.edu. There's lots of hands out there. Anybody else want to weigh in on that really quick? So the brain is like the only organ we don't screen, which is crazy, right? I was telling you when I turned 50, my doctor wanted me to have a colonoscopy. I asked him why he didn't want to look at my brain. Wasn't the other end just as important? And I think if you have dementia in your family, that you should get a functional imaging study when you're 50, because we, we know that they show evidence of trouble long before you actually have symptoms, when interventions are more likely to matter, to, to be effective. You know, typically when people get scanned, they're in the moderate to severe stages of the illness, when a lot less can be d done about it. Uh, I think we need to get to the point where we're doing population screening using cognitive testing to go compared to a general population, where are you at? On our website, we actually have a really cool website called My Brain Fit Life. On, you can test your brain, and then based on how you score, we'll give you suggestions for cognitive exercises. All of Tana's recipes are on that site. We have coaches. I'm one of the coaches on the site. Um, so on My Brain Fit Life, we have a, a test called Web Neuro, and it measures 17 areas of cognitive functioning, and two, including two memory tests. Okay, I'm going to try to get these questions. If you're looking, I know um, you can contact, I think you have probably, and if you don't, um, we will tell you right before we wrap up how to get in touch with all of us so you can find out more about all these great resources, find out about um, research studies. Um, if you're looking for clinical trials too, there's an advocacy group that I participated in called A-List 1000. They'll take you through, am I right for trials? They'll help you go through a decision tree, um, and then they'll um, help you find which ones are near you. Um, this is all a nonprofit um, uh, kind of yes or no sort of process. So lots of ways to, to kind of break that down. Your question. 
Uh, quick question. One of the things I've heard people say frequently is, well, I'd like to get my brain tested in, in all the ways that, that you're talking about and audience members are talking about, but I don't do it because I'm afraid that once there is a diagnosis written down by a physician, I become ineligible for a lot of things and also I'm, I'm no longer able to be treated seriously for things about wills and other things. Is there merit to that? I, I'm seeing a lot of shaking heads. And if so, how do you get around it short of having a friend who will unofficially do a diagnosis but not put it into your records? Great question. Yeah, well, I think sadly it, it is a very important um, and timely question. And you know, there was a New York Times article last week about long buying long-term care insurance because of doing 23andMe and learning you're an ABOB4 carrier. And, and there are real risks around any sort of diagnostic test, um, perhaps especially for people who, who don't yet have problems. And you know, we are doing trials now in people who have a PET scan that suggests they have amyloid accumulating in the brain, though they have normal cog cognitive performance. And the hope is that by intervening early, we can stave off dementia from occurring. We had to do tremendous work and, and thought had to go into those studies to protect the people who would enroll. And for example, we had to make sure that the medical record at the academic and other institutions that were doing the studies didn't link to the PET scan results because we didn't want people to be denied for long-term care insurance or to have their health insurance affected in a way. We didn't want their clinicians to look at them differently if they went into the medical record and saw that they were eligible to be in this study. Um, and I'm worried that we didn't go far enough. And we're working very hard now on additional studies to try to protect people who, who meet these criteria that suggest they're at increased risk to someday get problems. I, I think I agree totally with what Dr. Amos said. We need to get to a place where we're scanning or doing a blood test or a cognitive screener on everybody at some age, 50, 60, whatever it is. Um, but there are a lot of things that have to happen in order to get us there so that we're doing it in a responsible and safe way and that people aren't suffering. And we're going to redefine Alzheimer's disease. It, it's inevitable. Um, but we have to do it responsibly from a societal way. So in the meantime, pay for it and keep it out of your medical record. That's what I tell my patients. If I order an APO E4, you know, no one can get my medical record unless you give them permission to get my medical record. Don't have your insurance don't Which have means your don't insurance. have your insurance pay for, for it. For now, tragically, I mean, and I know a lot of us deal in this area, um, unfortunately, the way the world works now, there are lots of reasons for a person who has the diagnosis to be discriminated against um, socially, financially, I mean, there are lots of ways to take hits. Right to, right to die, lots of reasons. And so it is probably, I mean, I'm speaking as a lay person, 100% lay person. I'm not giving you any kind of advice other than girlfriend to girlfriend. Um, you are probably best off not doing that or um, before getting an actual diagnosis, getting a lot of things in order um, just so that you retain a lot of your rights and a lot of your um, flexibility. That's just that, because we've got to get to a place where we have, this is why we're funding this research, because um, we know that the, where, the, where the money goes, we're going to ultimately end up getting some kinds of treatments, remedies, ultimately we hope cures, but we've got to be living with this diagnosis. Uh, we can't be labeled with it, labeled by it. We have to live with it, and when we can live with it, then it will be like, great, I have Alzheimer's, and I have a job, and I have kids, and I have a right to all the other things that anyone else is doing. But right now, we're not even close to that. We're not. If I, if I could add just one thing, medicine, and perhaps my field especially, has a history of being slightly paternalistic about these things. And, and I'm not in that same vein. However, you could also ask yourself one potentially important question, which is, what would I do differently based on the results of this. And if you think about it, everything you've heard today can be done regardless of what the results of that test, whatever test it would be, <laughs> turned out. Um, I'm not saying you shouldn't do it. I, I think it, we live in an age where people can make these decisions for themselves. I, I highly advise talking to clinicians and other experts 
when you approach those decisions, but the reality is we all should be doing everything we can, regardless of our genotype, maybe even regardless of our scan results. Scans change over time. And so even if your scan is clean, whatever scan it ends up being, it may not be one, five, or ten years from now. So all the things you heard today are all things you should do regardless. If you have a brain, you're at risk. If it's in your family, it doesn't mean it's you. If it's not in your family, it doesn't mean you have a free ride. We all should be taking the precautions every day. You're right. You're hundred percent. Look at all these hands. Oh my goodness. Wow. Who didn't get you got one. You didn't get one. <laughs> Sorry. That's my training, right? I'm glad you brought us back to um, what if you have it now? And it and this is kind of major and it brings us back to Lori's site. I bumped into her site one day and got on to dementia chats, which are people who have Alzheimer's. I watched 11 hours straight of that because I was so shocked at these people were absolutely alive, living it with every day, talking about things that they need. I, it was so unbelievably refreshing. So when you get the diagnosis, it's not that you go into this immediate depression. They became active, and they are very active in, in talking and discussing and working with Congress people. It, 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 was, it takes also the fear away, and fear is really one of the things for, for any type of disease. The minute you have a fear and the minute you start living that or thinking that or afraid of it, it becomes you. I mean, you, you feed on it. Your body feeds on it. And it's, that's not healthy either. So um, I found that to be rather interesting. How cool for you, Lori. That's so great that, that you have that platform and that that's the work that you do and look what's happening. Well, it is uh, very exciting, and again, with my journey with my mom of 30 years, um, she taught me so many lessons. Um, like everybody in our life, there are lessons to be learned if we're open to learning them, and that's why I think it's so important to stay socially active, look into the memory cafes. We're actually doing a cruise this November for people with early memory loss in their families, and we're gonna have a symposium, but it's all about creating moments moments of joy, you're not going to find what you don't look for. And um, another, I guess, tip I'd like to add is that, um, you know, I used to be the, um, the queen of checklists in caring for my mom, which probably many of you are, and we're, we feel empowered when we check off our list. Um, it makes us feel good because we're out of control, but I found that I had to switch from um, my, my list of to-dos to three simple things to really improve my interaction and my peacefulness within. And that was before every interaction, if it was on the phone, if it was in person, whatever, I had to ask myself, is she safe, is she happy, and is she pain-free? That's what I need to focus on. And when I focused on that, it changed everything in terms of how I do my tasks. Some I found I didn't need to do. Some I found I, I could actually let somebody else do it or ask for help. Um, but it allowed me to be a daughter again. And so I'm just going to give a plug in the very back um, down at the Alzheimer's uh, a research and Prevention Foundation, I did put some brochures, so if you're dealing with somebody with dementia, there's a whole bunch of tips of just really simple, simple things to do um, to empower the person with dementia and yourself and embrace um, and live life gracefully, like you were saying, Lisa. Malika, I, I just want to, um, you guys can stay after and, and ask questions, but I would like for us to um, offer you a moment to offer us some uh, practical tips on how to demystify, I think, one of the through lines of today, which is um, we can all take advantage of meditation. Uh, it's something that's out there for us, and yet I think that we're a little bit um, ambiguous about how do I get it and what do I do. So can, can you sure, and we'll do help us so out? In the, in the typical, we don't have enough time, um, let's take a moment to actually give ourselves time. So I'm just going to give you a really simple exercise, um, and we'll do it together now, and um, then we can move on. So it's to stop. And I loved your words about 
slowing down, stopping, and just appreciating the moment. So stop is S-T-O-P. And we'll do it together. I'll first tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to stop. And you can do this anytime, any place. In fact, it's a great exercise to do when you find that you're getting reactive to a situation and getting stressed out. So S is for stop. T is for take three breaths. O is for observe what's happening in your body. And P is proceed. So if you're willing to do it right now, um, just sit comfortably. I recommend you close your eyes, but you don't have to close your eyes. So if you're comfortable closing your eyes, go ahead. And just again, the process. We've stopped. Now take three breaths. Breathe in and out. In and out. In and out. And now continue breathing, but let's just take a moment and observe how you are feeling. It may be physical after this morning of great exercise. It may be mental, a lot of intellectual stimulation. It may be emotional. So just take a moment and observe how you are feeling. And now you can open your eyes and proceed. So simple. And that's as simple as it is. And do you feel slightly calmer and slightly more centered and grateful? That's how I feel. Very, very grateful. Grateful to Maria, grateful that we have this women's Alzheimer's movement, grateful to these brilliant, compassionate, caring, and um, very insightful panelists who I told you we had the rock star panelists for today. So um, I'm gonna be mindful of everybody's time as we thank you and thank them so much for today. This has been fantastic. Thank you so much.